This is a Global Player original podcast. Oh, some good stuff this week. I've skipped ahead about five months from last week's because it all got a bit serious with the mad bat disease. And so um, I've rejoined the show at The Funny. Uh, We were witnessing the sale of a £360,000 sheep. I measured the size of Nigel Farage's mouth. People were getting wound up about a song. And I had just performed my usual accurate mental arithmetic to go from European Surrender Centre Rage to Her Majesty's Patriotic Fahrenheit. Uh, By the way, last year's late August Bank Holiday Monday, the hottest ever, 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 ever. But not this year. We could see some places getting the coldest maximum temperatures on record this Bank Holiday Monday, says uh, the meteorologist Emma. And as an aside, the wind did have an effect on our electrical supply, by which I mean it didn't blow uh, masts down. It actually gave us a lot of electricity. Squirted it up the grid, it did. (laughs) Storm Ellen's gales brought the highest ever share of wind power on the electricity system as wind turbines supply. Guess how much the wind turbines supplied of our electricity needs. Guess. Uh, 80%. Is the wrong answer foolish boy you see if you ask somebody like that a a question like that and if they overestimate then it makes the actual figure seem uh, puny by comparison but it's actually a a huge number but he made the huge number seem like a small number because he guessed too high (sighs) the actual number 59.1 percent that's mass it's not as big as 80 but it is very, very big. Wind uh, turbines contributed their highest ever share of power on the electricity system, supplied 59.1% of Britain's power on Saturday at 1am, <laughs> when we were all asleep. <laughs> Nobody's using power at 1am. Anyway, it was green power. Groovy. Gavin and Crawley says, How is Nick Abbott allowed to get away with these, quotes, maths sums? They are always wrong. Huh? And he doesn't know how to work out temperature. <laughs> That's an outrage. I'm going to sue you. It says, Bet he didn't want to work out how much we paid to the un anti democratic EU. Hurrah for Brexit, all in capital letters. What are you talking about, man? Um, let's have a call in uh, Falkirk. Hello, John. How are we doing, Nick? Good, thanks. Um, I don't. I'm, I'm kind of torn between whether I've got to talk about Bojo or that great orange guy across across the water. Which which is it to be? Well, they are almost. Um, I joined at the hip. They are as one person to me, but I don't know. Pick, pick. Mm, either, either you've got the guy that's uh, a wee bit closer to us that's threatening everybody. You, you've either got to get back to work or you're going to be unemployed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, a little or, light or, encouragement or, didn't work, so now he's uh, threatening you with a sack. Or, or Nick, the guy across the water, um, uh, where do I start with him? Where do I start? Start at the very beginning. It's a very good place to start. Hmm. Um, he's, he's, he's the best guy there's ever been since Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. Would you I've make been successful that? in every business I've been in been successful in every business he's been in. I should have asked him about the, um, the the enormous contribution that wind power has made to our electricity supply. I know a lot about wind. I know a lot about wind. Wind is just one of the many things that he knows a lot about. Isn't that right, John? Well, 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 it's kind of, it's kind of, it's kind of right up there, isn't it? Yeah. But if you get, if you get the wind, and the direction comes in in the correct order. Yeah, then uh, whoever uh, dealt it uh, smelt it. Whoever smelt it dealt it. Silent but violent. You know, one of those things. Yeah, all right. Thanks a lot, mate. 0345 
6060973. Let's have a call in uh, Pembrokeshire. Neil. Hi, Nick. How are you doing? Good, thanks. Good, good. Um, in the weather you were talking about earlier um, on the motorway yesterday, mm. um, it's not really that bad. Are you kidding? To, uh, down here. I mean, you know, we've had 70 mile an hour winds this week yeah. in Pembrokeshire, and yeah, it's been sheeting down all week. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, but but anyway, yeah, as, I, as you, you would say, stop whining and all that. Um, the, um, I, was, I listened to the news earlier, and uh, Zora Solomon was talking about the £360,000 sheep. Yeah, can you believe it? Something. Did you yeah, see that I, thing? I haven't seen it yet, but that's I the got... weirdest looking sheep I've ever seen in my life. It was square. It, 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 it was a shape that sheep don't come in. The thing yeah, was yeah. actually square. It, it looked like it uh, something had uh, come out of a video game. <laughs> it fucking been <laughs> pixelated. Well, I've got I've got thirty um, rescue sheep that we've rescued from the uh, slaughterhouses and all that business, and um, uh, and uh, we got one that's called Harvey, and he's about. Um, similar sort of shape to that, similar sort of size, but he's probably about 360 pounds rather than 360,000 yeah. pounds um, in weight, probably. Um, but he's, he's a big boy, but he's a, he's a lovely boy, he's soft, soft lad. You've got um, rescue sheep. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I've got one sat next to me at the moment. Actually, she's a she's a badger faced Welsh mountain sheep, um, Lola. Uh, she's got no teeth. <laughs> Lola. Um, she has no teeth anymore. She's about ten years old, and she's chomping right. on some soft food at the moment. Um, but I, I just wonder when you talk about your, you know, I'm just wondering thinking about your clips that you you put into your show. Did you ever watch a program on TV called Dream On? No. Oh wait, yes, yes, I did. Yeah, Brian that's that, that's a long time ago. It is, yeah, and it always reminds me. Your show always reminds me of that because the clips they used to put in the clips of movies and things like yeah. that. Yeah, I like haven't seen that, and inst- I used to enjoy that. Uh, I haven't seen uh, that in so long. You think that with all the television program uh, t- channels that we've got, that that would have come around eventually? But absolutely, you know, I've got on, got on DVD, but uh, don't see it on TV anymore. Right. But great show. Really I'll funny. look it up again. Excellent yeah, suggestion. Do, do Thank- your homework. Nick. <laughs> I refuse to do my homework. I will not. 0345 6060 973. Yeah, that was the weirdest looking uh, sheep, um, among the weirdest looking animals I've ever seen in my life, because I expected to uh, see uh, some gorgeous farmyard animal, but it was just weird. It was as though somebody had designed a sheep with a set square. <laughs> it had corners. Mike texts, Nick, uh, all these people uh, ringing you up asking you, how are you? Why don't you just remind them that you've invited them on your show not to assess your well-being, says Mike. He was picking a fight. Back under your bridge, troll. And he says, um, Nick Abbott always gets the sums and the temperatures wrong. I've noticed this too. I thought I was going mad. So glad that someone has noticed, says Annie. I don't know what you're talking about. My mental arithmetic is acute. (coughs) That sheep, not cute, at all. Um, I wonder what other sheep are going to... Because it's got... You know, it, it has a job to do. It's got to uh, go and um, have uh, hot sheep loving with um, many, many other sheep. Disgusting. I wonder what they're going to think. What's this square thing coming at me? <laughs> it just was the weirdest looking sheep I've ever seen. I mean, I'm no expert on sheep or anything else for that matter. But that was one strange animal. What's that video game where everything is square? Is it War, War Game of Warcraft or... Um, I bet you know. You, you're a young person. What, what's that game where everything is square? Oh, God, I don't know. I'm trying to look it up now. Oh, my God. You haven't known one single thing that I've asked you no, so far on this sorry. show. <laughs> it's a terrible performance so far. But don't worry. I'll work through it. I'm a professional. Natalie emails, the manufactured faux outrage about the... OK, here we go. All right, well, I'll get into this after the news. But to set it up, Natalie says, the manufactured faux outrage about Land of Hope and Glory must be a new low for the... (laughs) Now, get ready. This is her saying this, not me. The manufactured faux outrage about Land of Hope and Glory must be a new low for the Brexit nut jobs. We've got a few idiots in our party. That's her saying that, not me. 
Brexit nutjobs, you say? I'm a nutcase. Can't imagine a land with less hope and complete lack of glory than the UK at the moment, says Natalie. That video of a group of semi-animated... <laughs> semi, semi-animated tins of spam trying to sing the song with the unfortunate handicap of not actually knowing the words was amazing. <laughs> yeah. I enjoyed that too. It's amazing how wide he can open his mouth, isn't it? I mean, it's like the Mersey Tunnel. It is huge. It's like he can unhinge his jaw like a snake. Anyway. That video of a group of semi-animated tins of spam trying to sing the song with the unfortunate handicap of not actually knowing the words was amazing, says Natalie. Amazing as in science fiction. <laughs> and in second place for Laugh of the Week, Boris ranting to a bunch of confused and bored school children while he's being trolled by a genius librarian's selection of books in the shelves behind him, says Natalie. Yeah, it was a pretty good week. Well, I'll get into that in a minute. Oh. So many people texting and saying the game is Minecraft. Never played it, says uh, the uh, glamorous assistant sitting next door. Yeah, Minecraft. That sheep looks like it's come from Minecraft. Not that I have any idea what I'm talking about now. But it's, it was square. And it didn't um, bar like a sheep, it yapped like a dog. <laughs> Very suspicious. You're better informed than I am. I don't know anything. Uh... Tim in Livingston says, I know you're not happy with the government's pandemic response, but please rest assured that lessons will be learned. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, there. That's right. Yeah. No, they won't. They'll say that, and then they'll learn no lessons. That story about the books, though, rather amusing. So Boris Johnson showed up at a school to flap his arms around and, uh, you know, ruffle his hair, you know, do his act. And the story in the uh, Super Soraway Guardian is as follows. The school librarian who stacked the shelves behind Boris Johnson's podium with titles including, but not limited to, The Twits, Betrayed and The Subtle Knife has admitted that she never intended the message for the Prime Minister but for the management of the school from which she resigned in February. The former librarian in a school in Leicestershire rose to fame earlier this week when Johnson addressed children preparing to return to classrooms from the school's library. Behind him, the books on display, which in also included Betrayed, Resistance, Exodus and Fahrenheit 451, appeared to be sending a subtle message about the Prime Minister and his government. But the librarian in question, who was asked not to be named, said that she set up the display six months ago in a pointed message to the management of Castle Rock School. And no nobody's, nobody's moved a thing on those shelves in six months. That doesn't say very much about that school. Never mind. Ant says, It's so funny, all these people convinced they found an error in your arithmetic, presumably un unaware that you are a maths genius. Yes, I'm a prodigy. That is correct. Most listeners surely recognise your prodigious numeracy. So don't pay attention to the naysayers. I won't. I refuse to pay attention to the naysayers. Hayes, Lewis. Evening. Evening. Nick. Yes, sir. Hello, how are you? Are you okay? Yes, great, mate. Um, basically, basically, things are going like this at the moment. If things seem to be on the up there, on the anticlimax, and they're going down, if they're going up, they're going down. They can't come in, they can't shake it all about anymore. If this place in England is closed, that place in England is open. And I'm from Hayes, that's near the Heathrow Airport. And uh, basically, by this, what I'm trying to say, Prodigy, is uh, where the mathematicians go, they go with you, and they go with me. If you come with me, I'll come with you. If you come in, I'll come out. If I shake it all about, I'll shake it all about. If I yeah. go down here, mm -hmm. I go up here. Yeah. Unfortunately, we've run out of time on that call. That is so unfortunate. I hate when that happens. Stephen Upminster says, All the blame for COVID-19, Brexit and car door rubber seals can be laid at the door of David Bowie and Prince. Yeah, not Prince, David Bowie. Dave, everything went to pot when David Bowie died. Thanks a lot, David Bowie. You couldn't have hung on for another couple of years. Uh, Bruce in... Bruce... <laughs> Bruce in North East Scotland texts, I discovered due to palm oil, orangutans are losing their homes. More shocking was the news that one had moved into the White House. Oh, God. Listener with material. Listener with material. Oh, no. Too many listeners with material. 
Uh, Worcester. Hello, Dave. Hi, good evening, Nick. How Dave. are you? Good, thanks. Yeah, I think you're right. First one, I'd like to know. I think that what you said about that sheep, it is unusual. Um, nature doesn't tend to produce squares. No. It's, uh, it looks man-made. Uh, maybe you're thinking <laughs> yes. of Tron. Yes, it does look man-made. Good. Exactly. It does. Like Tron. Remember the film Tron? No. It looks like um, somebody had just covered a wooden... Uh, <laughs> model with wool. <laughs> yeah, the weirdest looking are. thing I've ever seen. That was such well, a strange it, sheep. But, the, but the farmers, the sheep. farmers mm. were just falling over themselves. Yeah. Well, maybe it's genetically uh, able to reproduce on a on a on a massive on industrial scale. On a, yeah. Industrial scale. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Pam in Kingston says forecast for Shrewsbury. Don't say rain. Pam, rain. That's just a guess on my part. Uh, Jose says, "Are you sure you watched the sheep and not SpongeBob SquarePants?" Well, it did. It was a. It was a, a square sheep. It was the funniest looking thing I've ever seen. Funny, not ha ha. Funny, weird. Like it wasn't real. But you know, farmers were just. They had um, uh, hearts and pound signs in their eyes. That is an in uh, a, um, a a, sh- a sheep. Loving sheep on an industrial scale, like that last caller was uh, saying. All right, here's that story then. Eamon Holmes and Nigel Farage clashed with activist... Um, I don't really know how to pronounce this, so I'll give it a go. Femi Oluwoli. Eamon Holmes, Nigel Farage clashed with activist Femi Oluwoli this morning after he claimed that he, the activist claimed most people don't really care about whether Royal Britannia or Land and Hope and Glory are sung at the proms. Correct. That's right. Most people don't care. And their indifference was completely drowned out by the clenched fist brigade, yelling about their rights and liberties. This is the biggest bunch of nothing I've ever heard. A, a plea to the permanently angry to get whipped up about a total non-event that doesn't impact them at all. It's amazing how easily we are distracted. we got the worst outcome of fighting the virus than any other country on Earth apart from our new owners, the United States of America. The economy is crumbling all about us, with no one in the current administration up to the job of pulling us out of this nosedive. We've got a Prime Minister who seems to only show up to promote the interests of the companies that donate to his party and to do his funny bloke off the telly routine. We've got advice on safety changing according to the direction of the wind. The Russians seem to have as much influence over the direction of this country as the billionaires supporting Donald Trump. And the investigation into that seems to have vanished without a trace, which isn't suspicious at all. The schools are going back with everything that entails. Shops are closing, millions out of work. The prospect is dire. And all we've been talking about this week is the confected outrage of people who won't be able to hear words they don't know to songs they wouldn't buy on a TV station they don't watch. Oh, fabulous. Good grief. The Mail put it like this. The BBC is under mounting pressure over its decision to censor the lyrics of the proms, anthems and play instrumental versions because woke activists find them racist. And the backlash includes BBC employees, a former BBC chairman and Boris Johnson. OK. Woke activists. What does the word woke mean in that sentence? because it gets thrown out a lot. I mean, it's allied to snowflake and lefty and all the other things that certain people recite as though they were using insult roulette. Where will the ball land now? Oh, it's, oh and yeah, it's political correctness gone mad. <coughs> Woke means being aware of and actively attentive to important facts and issues especially issues of uh, racial and social... That's according to the Crucive Verbalist's Bible, Merriam-Webster. And being attentive to others is now considered a bad thing. Well, the whole world's gone crazy. Just this week, people were burning 
their National Trust memberships because the keeper of many of the mansions built on the money made from slavery were going to put up notices explaining that fact in some of their properties and on some of their knick-knacks. That's where we are now. Members of an historical society are furious that the organisation is teaching history. <laughs> what a way to run a country, eh? Dreadful. And of course Boris Johnson jumped on the bandwagon of phony flag-waving. He never saw a pretend patriotic sloganeering bus he didn't want to be on. You could set your watch by him. Bozo condemned what he called the uh, corporation's cringing embarrassment about our history and that he could not believe the BBC's decision to censor the anthems. Really, he, he broke away from his uh, permanent, permanent vacation to say that, did he? He said that from uh, his bed, where he's hard at work on booking his next holiday. <laughs> it, was, it was pretty much the only thing that was on the news this week. Everything else continued to pace. The country is still uh, stuck in a nosedive, heading towards ground. And this is uh, th this was our weekly distraction. Last week it was uh, people in dinghies. But you've got to keep throwing stuff at the news, otherwise they get bored. And so this week it's this. I wonder what it's going to be next week. Place your bets. Fred the Cabby says, Hello Nick, over the past few years we've lost to Johnny Cash, Steve Jobs and Bob Hope. Now we have no jobs, no cash and no hope. That's cute. Kath in North Wales, Thed. Oh no, I've read that. Roland says, as you don't host a TV show, is there any chance you could live stream your show and what's your problem with Carol? These really deserve to be televised. Um, <laughs> I love your shows, they're like an education. They're not an education, they're like an education. No, nobody wants to see me. Why do you want to see a picture of me? This says, uh, all the fuss about maths is ridiculous that so many think that maths is an exact science. That's right. We have to stop thinking of maths as an exact science. There's no proof that it is. It's all about feelings. <laughs> And uh, Bobin Cumbran says, I bow to your stunning command of all things mathematical. Not only are you articulate and an outstanding orator, why aren't you a Nobel Prize winner? That's right. Nobody's given me the Nobel Prize yet. Damn it. Anyway, there's... Um, I've, I've got to... I have, I have to finish talking about those songs. But I don't think I've got any time. Uh, I haven't got enough time before the news. So I'll continue it afterwards because this was just so utterly ridiculous. And the usual suspects just got... It, it, it's so obvious that they're just deliberately winding themselves up because they enjoy being angry. And I've been there. I used to do it myself. And it, it's an addiction. There's so many people that are addicted to being angry these days. And you see it, but you see people doing it, and it goes in stages. You'll get a little bit annoyed for about something that is completely inconsequential. Like, oh, I don't know, raindrops falling down a window pane. Maybe a little bit more consequential than that, but, um, you know, you'll, uh, you'll... You'll drop your keys on the floor. Now... Ordinarily, people, somebody would just uh, reach down, pick them up, and carry on with their day. But no, if you're one of these people that's addicted to being angry, you'll go, Ugh. or something that starts you off. And the moment you do that, that, that reaction, the juice starts flowing in your brain. And you think, oh, yeah, there it is. I'm going to chase that. And so you get angrier, and then you get angrier still, and uh, all that, uh, whatever it is, the, um, what is that stuff that goes uh, around? It's like people um, throw themselves out of planes with, you know, attach a parachute on themselves first, and then chuck themselves out of a perfectly good plane. Or they go on roller coaster rides, or they see scary films, um, you know, stuff like that, to get that uh, rush of adrenaline. That's what you're high on. 
You're getting high on adrenaline. It's a drug that you're producing inside your own brain. Want to score some pot? Totally legally. And that's what um, being addicted to anger is all about. People also get addicted to uh, being stressed. Same thing. Oh, no, what's going to happen? Oh, no, like that. And I've been there. I used to uh, do that anger thing until I thought, what actually, why on earth am I working myself up about something that's completely inconsequential? And I realised I'm doing it because I was a drug addict. High on the drug that uh, I made inside or what's left of my brain. And if you're one of those people, then just pause and think about what you're doing. And you can change that behaviour. Once you realise what you're doing, then you can see it in yourself and you can stop yourself going down that route because there's nothing good at the end of that road at all. Misery lies that way. And um, you can thank me late. No, wait, I've changed my mind. You can thank me now. Thank you. Patrick in the Docklands says, I remembered your prediction that uh, Trump wouldn't leave when he said in his latest speech, now, if you really want to drive him crazy, say 12 more years. If they can extend the candy floss treatment for, from his hair to his brain cell, we might have a serious problem ahead. Donald Trump's not leaving. I mean, he's already said as much. He says the quiet part out loud. Because he has no filter. Because nobody has ever told him no. <laughs> Every time he screwed up, Daddy gave him another hundred million dollars. Which is why he can make the false claim... I make $400 million a year, so what difference does it make? He's never made $400 million in his whole life. Daddy gave him $400 million. Maybe that's what he means. He ain't going. He doesn't joke about stuff at all. He has no sense of humour about himself. So when he says 12 more years, or I should redo my first uh, uh, term because they were spying on me. <laughs> he actually said that. I should get to redo my first term because uh, uh, Obakarama was spying on me. <laughs> uh, and his uh, demented Yeehaw fans started whooping and a cheering. You know, those people. No, he ain't going nowhere. They're going to have to drag him out of the White House. I mean, he's already set up America, his, his gun-toting, Bible-bashing fans to um, take to the streets in armed rebellion if he uh, loses the next election. Because the only way he can lose the next election is if it's fixed. He, to he said to the American people that the, the last election was fixed and he won that one. Can you imagine what he's going to be like if he l actually loses? <laughs> And I can't stand him. Stop going on about its lovely coat and its chisel features. It's freaking me out. Just pack it in. It's a sheep. And the farmer was saying, oh, its head, its hair, its eyes, its legs. Please. That sheep wasn't that good looking. I've seen better. 0345 6060 973. Scott in Edinburgh says, uh, after seeing that square sheep, it makes Dolly the clone sheep look like an amateur. Well, it makes it look like a sheep. I don't know what that thing that um, they bought uh, uh, yesterday was. Uh, it wasn't a sheep. It looked like. Um, it, lo <laughs> it looked like a, a, like a gymnastic uh, horse. What do they call those things? The horse. The, the wooden horse. Like, you know, a wooden horse. It looked like a wooden horse for toddlers. Silliest thing I've ever seen. Anyway. A pommel horse, exactly. A pommel horse is the right answer. First thing I've got right, he says. Yes, congratulations. Only took you an hour. <laughs> uh, Reggie says, just swooping in to say Adam West was the best Batman ever. Well, he was the funniest. I can't really watch those Batman films... Uh, not because I find them disturbing or, uh, or boring or anything like that. Just just because you can't see what's going on. They're just <laughs> completely black. You can't see anything. 
Mart's tweets, we're listening to you as we drive down to the south of France to escape autumn, or is it winter? If you get it in order, you uh, get extra points. If you get it in order, you get extra points. Don't forget that. If you get it in order, you get extra points. Extra points for getting it in order. From the man who knows his words. I'm very highly educated. I know words. I have the best words. That is a sentence that disproves itself. I'm very highly educated. I know words. I have the best words. No highly educated person would ever say that. You're an idiot, Donald Trump, and I mean that with all the respect that the office deserves. <laughs> he used to deserve a lot of respect. And then you came along. A president! <laughs> Can you believe it? And that's it. And that was me talking about four months before his fans did try an armed coup. It, it's, it's like I can see the future. I'm a medium. Sometimes I'm a large. Depends who's making the clothes. And don't forget the other podcast that I do. There's the one that I do with Carol McGiffin called What's Your Problem with Nick and Carol? In which Carol McGiffin and I try to solve people's problems while honking our faces off. If you want us to have a bash at your issue, you must send it to the following address. Nick and Carol at global.com. N-I-C-K-A-N-D-C-A-R-O-L at global.com. And be prepared for total satisfaction. Ask for it by name on an internet near you. What's your problem with Nick and Carol? And there's the whole show podcast, which is, as it sounds, the whole show. From my Friday and Saturday night stints on the radio, we take the news and the ads out. It takes less time to listen to. You'll use less electricity, and by this time next year, you'll have saved up enough to buy a baked bean. And I'll be back on the radio Friday, Saturday, Sunday night at 10. And until then, I'll be seeing you. Bye-bye.